We need ministers that have integrity to work with our community. I am so done with people promising us stuff and then not following through. Tonight, the resignation of Jane Philpott. Some agree with her principles. Others thought she gave up too much power. I would think that Mr. Wernick, as the head of the public service, should have been there to remind the government, well, wait a second. The actions of the highest level government office will be in the spotlight again tomorrow with key testimonies of the Justice Committee. We started it back in the day because we just didn't see much northern content up on the screen when we'd have a film festival here. And a look inside the growing, uniquely north horror film industry. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. Reaction is still coming in about the resignation of former Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott. Her resignation follows that of former Justice Minister and Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould. APTN's Amber Bernard reports that some Indigenous leaders are unhappy with her decision, while others support her move. Indigenous lawyer and activist Joan Jack says she's proud of Jane Philpott's decision to leave Cabinet. As an Indigenous woman, I was very moved to see a uh, non-Indigenous woman stand with Jody and take such a principled position. I was very proud of her. While Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand says Philpott's resignation means she's abandoning Indigenous issues, especially when she was Treasury Board President and still able to affect fiscal policy. She was hope to them. She was the champion that they would waited for to come along and for her to just walk away because it's her principles that are being affected right now. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, how about the principles of those children, the principle of her commitment, the principle of all those other issues that are so fundamental. Is, is her principle more important than all of the tens of thousands of children out there? I don't think so. Jack says it's not abandonment, but standing up for Indigenous rights in Canada. No, I, I'm not disappointed in her resignation at all. And I think the work that the Canadian state has to do with our people will continue no matter who the minister is. And what's relevant is that we need ministers that have integrity to work with our community. I am so done with people promising us stuff and then not following through. Despite the resignations of Phil Pott and Wilson Raybould, Chartrand doesn't see Crown Indigenous relations changing. He believes Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is the real champion in that relationship. He's the one who set the template of where his government's going. He's the one who stated we are putting Indigenous people first. Wrote a letter to every one of them, including Phil Pott, including uh, uh, Jason w Jody Wilson Raybould, and every minister saying that Indigenous matters is the number one priority for our government and it's the number one matter you must achieve as a minister. The SNC-Lavalin scandal will continue tomorrow morning. That's when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's former Principal Secretary, Gerald Butts, is expected to appear before the Justice Committee. Following in the afternoon, it'll be the Privy Clerk Council, Michael Wernick. Amber Bernard, APTN National News, Ottawa. Tomorrow, the Justice Committee will hear from more witnesses. That's when Prime Minister Trudeau's senior political advisor, Gerald Butts, testifies. As well, the clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Wernick, will speak for a second time. Alan Freeman is a former journalist and currently a senior fellow in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. He wrote an opinion piece on Wernick for iPolitics, in which he says Wernick should have spoken his own truth to power. Freeman joins us now from Ottawa. Alan, thanks for joining us. I want to start with something you wrote that really kind of sets the stage in terms of who Michael Wernick is and what his job is, in case it's not clear to our viewers. You wrote, quote, uh, you would think that the person in the federal government fighting at every turn to protect nonpartisan, apolitical public service would be the clerk of the Privy Council. But Michael Wernick has shown himself throughout this affair as having misunderstood that role or completely forgotten about it in his efforts to please his political bosses. Can you explain to us what the problem with this is? Okay, so Michael Wernick is the top uh, senior public servant in the government. So he's nonpartisan. He's uh, not an elected official. Um, he, uh, you know, he, he did come into the job just after the Liberals came into power. But theoretically, the, they're like deputy ministers. Every department has a deputy minister who's a senior public servant in the department. The Deputy Minister of all Deputy Ministers is Michael Wernick. He also happens to be the Deputy Minister for the Prime Minister. So he's got, he wears, I think it's three different hats. 
So he's, but, he's um, like the top bureaucrat, I guess. Exactly. So, and he's not only defended the PMO in this, but also several individual cabinet ministers uh, for their high standard of ethics. All of this without prompting to do so, as you point out in the op-ed, uh, while he's also thrown some shade on Jody Wilson-Raybould's character. This, of course, isn't his job if, it's, uh, if he's to be apolitical. Why, why is he doing this? What's your theory? You know, well, the thing is, he does, have, he does wear a couple of hats. So he's the deputy minister for the prime minister. So he's supposed to sort of back up the prime minister's office, which is really the political wing, uh, which is you know made up of not of public, full-time public servants, but people who are brought in uh, by whoever is prime minister. So he's in charge, but he's supposed to be providing them with sort of uh, basically technical, uh, factual backup, um, you know, all sorts of coordination. Uh, but he's also the head of the public service, which is supposed to be nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the thing is, is that. Um, Increasingly, the Privy Council office, which he runs and is sort of twinned with the PMO, uh, the Prime Minister's office, and this goes back to Harper and before, has been really sort of shoved m more, more and more into do more to really helping the Prime Minister, helping the government in power do their thing, which ends up, uh, I think, going too often into the political realm, right? Yeah. So even though there's, so that, that I think is the problem, and the, the thing is, is that, um, He's really the, you know, uh, there are all these political people around him, ministers, the prime minister, chiefs of staff, etc., who are all pressuring him to do one thing or another. And I think that sometimes uh, maybe uh, somebody like Wernick succumbs and just figures and maybe gets a little confused about what he's supposed to be doing. Well, and you've, you've called him, quote, a serial partisan, a chameleon who changes his stripes uh, as governments change. And, and you said that he's, he, you know, he predates the Liberal government. He's been in politics for a long time. He was there with Harper's government. But when yeah. you have this sort of behavior, what does it do to the system? Well, I think what happens in the system is that, you know, I know this is sort of sounds like something out of political science class. There's this idea of truth to power, mm -hmm. uh, of speaking truth to power. So in other words, if you're a public servant and a politician comes before you and suggests something, right, which he thinks is a, well, is a, poli a wonderful political fix to an issue, the, the, the nonpartisan public servant is there to sort of say, wait a second, um, this may not be fully legal. You may have to change the law to do this. This is going to get you into all sorts of trouble with something else. Um, we cannot really do this. So. The, the problem is that if you've got a system where deputy ministers and up to Mr. Wernick seem to be sort of going along uh, with what the with government is asking it in all cases, then we've got a problem. You know, we have this whole, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a sort of parallel to the Phoenix pay system, okay? That was started under Harper, right? Mm -hmm. The Harper government really wanted to go ahead with this centralization of pay because they wanted to put jobs in New Brunswick, etc. Now, did the bureaucrats there sort of say, wait a second, there may have been bureaucrats who thought, you know what, this isn't a very good idea. There are all sorts of possibilities that this is going to fail. But perhaps they're held back because they're under so much pressure to please their political bosses. And that is, and that's why I find this is a little bit disturbing because in the case we're at hand, basically SNC-Lavalin, the Montreal company, the engineering company, was asking, didn't like the ruling by the head of the public prosecution service in a criminal case, right? Mm -hmm. So they thought, well, we can get this case sort of turned into a deferred prosecution agreement, which they wanted, some sort of settlement. But she is a public servant, and in the law, she's supposed to be the final word. The attorney general, meeting Jody Wilson-Raybould, can override her, but that's not, that's never done. It hasn't been done in 12 years. So they were, you know, so the, the, the question is, I would think that Mr. Wernick, as the head of the public service, should have been there to remind the government, wait a second, this is the role of the director of public prosecutors who is a public servant, to do this. Mm -hmm. This is his role to defend her, not to try to do a runaround or a workaround to sort of get her decision overturned. Mm -hmm. That's what really bothers me in this case. Well, I guess we're going to have to watch tomorrow for Wernick's testimony as well as uh, uh, Gerald yeah. Butt's testimony tomorrow and just see kind of how, how far they're willing to go uh, yeah. to the wall it's for the PMO. Yeah, because Wernick, one thing, Wernick appeared already, but then... 
uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould basically contradicted him, so mm -hmm. I think he's going to come back and try to correct what he said earlier. I don't really know. Well, we watch uh, eagerly. Thanks so much for sharing your insight into this. Okay, you're welcome. For more on why Indigenous peoples will want to pay attention to what Michael Wernick has to say during his testimony tomorrow, we're joined by policy analyst and former candidate for AFN National Chief, Russ Daibo. Russ, thanks so much for joining us. I'd like to start by just getting your thoughts on the last few weeks. Two well-respected cabinet ministers resigning over a lack of confidence in their prime minister. Yes, well, I think uh, when Jody Wilson-Raybould um, resigned, I think it was a shock to everybody, including me. Um, although, mind you, I, I wasn't too surprised because uh, she had been demoted. Um, and also at the same time that she was demoted uh, from Justice Minister to Veterans Affairs Minister, uh, they moved Jane Philpott, uh, a senior minister, um, out of the Indigenous Services into Treasury Board and put a junior minister in, Seamus O'Regan. So I thought those moves together were a bad sign um, for uh, the Indigenous issues heading into a new election. Mm -hmm. And um, her testimony uh, was quite riveting. I saw it. Uh, I certainly believe her. She's done a very good uh, um, chronology of um, what she says happened, you know, naming about 11 people and going through about 10, 10 instances where they put pressure on her as the Attorney General. Um, so I, I think on on the position she's taken as the Canadian Interior General is definitely a principled position and it's good. Uh, it certainly has uh, created a problem for the Trudeau government. Uh, and now with uh, Jane Philpott's resignation, uh, the two ministers basically echoing each other in terms of their uh, inability to sit at cabinet because they don't have confidence in the cabinet. And I presume the prime minister, since he heads the cabinet, uh, it's a very, um, a very big problem for this government. Uh, even though they have 33 ministers that are so, seem to be sticking with the prime minister, I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's pretty bad for them. Tomorrow, Russ, uh, Privy Council Clerk Michael Wernick will be testifying again at the Justice Committee. What is that? What What is it about uh, Wernick that uh, Indigenous peoples should be paying attention to? Well, you know, Indigenous peoples need to be aware that when um, political parties make promises during the election, like the Trudeau government did in 2015, about nation-to-nation -nation relationships and a new reconciliation process and everything, um, they should be aware that those uh, platforms are turned over to the bureaucracy to interpret and implement. And Michael Warnick, being the clerk of the Privy Council, is the top bureaucrat. And uh, he was named by Trudeau in January 2016 as the clerk of the Privy Council, which means he's Prime Minister's deputy minister. And he's the one that's the gatekeeper to the cabinet from all the uh, government departments. And he came from Indian Affairs. He was Harper's deputy minister of Indian Affairs for eight years. So all of the things we saw under the Harper government, the caps, the cuts, uh, you know, the spying on Cindy Blackstock for making a human rights complaint, uh, mm -hmm the spying on communities for hotspots. That was all him that uh, organized all of that. So now as clerk of the Privy Council, he can do a government-wide approach um, to Indigenous issues, and that's what he's been doing. And in fact, in his testimony uh, two weeks ago, uh, he confirmed that he's the one that's been behind this Indigenous rights recognition framework. Uh, he says because the Prime Minister was busy with the NAFTA negotiations. But I've long suspected that he was propping up um, Minister Carolyn Bennett, and he pretty much confirmed that in his testimony. Yeah, so that he, was uh, some interesting testimony there uh, related to the framework last week. Uh, Russ, what he, were... he, also, he also came out in very strong defense of her, mm -hmm. um, complaining about how she's been treated on social media. So that again shows me that he's the one that's propping her up in this framework that she's still promoting. Russ, we're running short on time, but I just want to get your thoughts. You know, the uh, Indigenous peoples came out in support of the Liberals uh, quite a bit last in the last federal election. Where do you see this going for the Liberals in this fall's coming election? I think a lot are going to stay home or vote for the NDP or the Greens. I can't see many voting for the Conservatives. But I think a lot are turned off by the Trudeau government, at, at, from what I've heard anyway and, and seen. I think a lot of First Nations peoples, Indigenous peoples are... Uh, 
are really uh, concerned about the treatment of Jody Wilson Raybould and uh, even Philpott. Um, she had gained a lot of trust from a lot of leaders, and um, there's now a lot of concern about the two of them resigning as to who's going to be speaking for Indigenous issues in the cabinet now. Well, tomorrow should be interesting, and so should the election. Uh, Russ, appreciate you taking some time for us here. Thank you. Mi'kmaq students got to orbit around an astronaut in their classroom. That story's coming up. But first, here's tomorrow's weather forecast and a sneak peek at a story that we're working on. I'm Brittany Hobson. Spring has almost sprung, but these kids are still taking advantage of the winter weather. The Spirit North Cross Country Ski Program has made its way to Manitoba for the first time this year, and four First Nation communities are benefiting from it. My favorite part is when the kids come asking, when's the next time, when's our group, when's our group the next time, so. And then seeing, seeing the, the reactions and their, their, their faces, like the, having fun. I'll have that story for you on tomorrow's APTN National News. Starting on the East Coast, minus two with snow for Halifax, minus seven in Fredericton. Minus 14 with snow for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Minus 21 in Inukshuak. Minus 9 under sunny skies for Montreal. 14 below in Shibugamu. Minus 8 for London. 7 below for Toronto and Sarnia. Minus 15 under sunny skies for Sioux Lookout. Snow and 9 below in Thunder Bay. Minus 16 for Puckettawagan. 12 below for Norway House and God's Lake. Minus 10 in Winnipeg, minus 9 across much of southern Manitoba. Minus 10 for Yorkton, Estevan, Swift Current, then North Battleford. Sunny and minus 15 for Uranium City. Welcome back. Mi'kmaq students got a chance to gaze into outer space and talk to an astronaut today. They were part of a program that is linking a Canadian in space with students. This particular astronaut has a personal connection with Indigenous peoples. Angel Moore brings us this story. The International Space Station was live. David St. Jacques described his life in outer space to a crowd of students at Dalhousie University. But the beauty and the grace of our planet is what surprises me every day. St. Jacques developed a friendship with Mi'kmaq students last year. The Canadian Space Agency partnered with the Digital Mi'kmaq program to promote science and technology education for Indigenous youth. Christopher Gugu says kids are learning and having fun. Uh, you know, it's, it's, for us as adults, we might not get those programs, you know, you know, and how important they are, how the connection with science and Indigenous knowledge, but to children, it's just fun for them. Gugu's and, uh, own kids are part of the group of Mi'kmaq students who came to the event. Brady Gugu asked St. Shock what was the most challenging thing about being an astronaut. That time of training that everything was pushing me to my limits. But maybe the most challenging thing itself is managing your own time and managing your own energy because you cannot do everything perfectly. You have to decide where to put your focus. Madison Gugu says St. Shock has a lesson for everyone. If you work hard enough in your life now, then it will help you in the future. St. Jacques was gifted an eagle feather, a basket, and took on a Mi'kmaq name, Dobbit, before he went to space. Shana Francis made that basket and feels a closeness with space. Well, our Mi'kmaq people have always had a deep connection with our stars and our moon and our skies, and we have night stories and day stories, and I, I just feel like this was just a connection that we can visibly see now rather than just talk about it with storytelling. Astronaut Joshua Kutrick was on hand to moderate questions from students. He says the program is making a difference. We affect the decisions that people make when it comes to studying, working, and what they go on to do uh, for themselves and for this country. Frances agrees. She hopes other kids will be inspired to reach for the stars. That anything is possible. <laughs> I'm just a kid from the res and my I just followed my passion and and big things happened. The Canadian Space Agency is hoping to send people to the moon and someday Mars. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Halifax. Time for us to take another quick break, but stick around, there's still more news to come. 
But first, here's a look at the rest of Wednesday's weather forecast. Picking back up in northern Alberta, minus 13 for Fort Chip, 14 below for Fort McMurray, minus 10 under sunny skies for Edmonton and Medicine Hat. On the west coast, 5 above for Vancouver and Victoria, plus 4 in Bella Coola, minus 8 in Fort Nelson, minus 9 in Dease Lake. In Yukon, minus 15 for Old Crow, 13 below for Dawson and Mayo, minus 8 in Fort Simpson, minus 9 for Norman Wells, minus 14 for Saks Harbor, 12 below in Sunny for Politak, minus 24 for Whale Cove, 25 below for Repulse Bay. Welcome back. Halloween is months away, but the city of Yellowknife braced itself for some scary times. Northern filmmakers were in town for what has become the largest film festival in Northwest Territories. Charlotte Murray Jacobs was there. In its seventh year, Dead North saw 40 films, and it's uniquely northern. Amateur filmmakers from the territories and other circumpolar countries have six weeks to make a five-minute film during the darkest and coldest months of the year. The Horror, Sci-Fi and Thriller Festival also includes workshops for filmmakers. Veronica Spears is part of the territory's growing film industry. She's teaching special effects makeup to this group. I love that it gives people an opportunity to do special effects makeup. Uh, when I first moved back to Yellowknife a few years ago, there was nothing like this. I never had a chance to play with makeup and do fun things like this. It's a prosthetic workshop, and her students excelled. They created these looks in under five hours. I think they really enjoyed painting their pieces and seeing their work come to life. And their hard work is paying off. The films are recognized through an award ceremony. But the awards aren't the main motivator for the four-day event. I think the true spirit of Dead North is sort of on the community, uh, that, like the, the, what I was saying about community. It's really about building uh, capacity here in the North for Northerners to tell Northern stories from a Northern point of view. That was why it was created. Uh, we, we started it back in the day because we just didn't see much Northern content up on the screen when we'd have a film festival here. In These are our new students. This festival attracts all sorts of non-film folks too. More schools Thank are getting guys. involved and we this year schools. half of They're the films were made learning. by women. We're 170 films in and now half of this community knows how to make a film. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellow Knight. Some great looking work there. Great, right, there is. It would be a cool festival to be at. That is your APTN National News for this Tuesday. And as we've been saying, tomorrow is a big day in Ottawa as hearings begin before the Justice Committee or resume. APTN News will be live on our Facebook page when testimony begins at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, we will be live on the network as we put the whole SNC Lavalin affair, resignations and all, in focus. You won't, won't want to miss that. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night. And I'm Dennis Ward. Tim Fontaine and the Laughing Drum is next. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.